from the heart of America, the nation's number one liberal voice, where truth and common sense rule. This is The Ed Schultz Show, where America comes to talk. Now, live from the studio at 30 Rock in New York, Ed Schultz. With Chris Matthews. Honored to have you with me here, my friend. Ed Schultz, my colleague, as they say. You know, Tom Brokaw. <laughs> have you ever said, my colleague? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think, I don't think usually, you're the kind of guy that doesn't put a pocket kerchief in his coat, you know, and you yeah. don't say, my colleague. <laughs> Neither do I, actually. Chris Matthews, who is uh, a, a stalwart performer on MSNBC. I don't know how he's done it for 15 years. 15? I'm, I'm I have ba- been in this business, live TV, every night since 94. Since 94. The, the year I quit drinking. Okay. <laughs> Coincidental? No. All right. Um, it's 15th anniversary of MSNBC. Right. Uh, you actually were the, the first show on this network so. that, that had some tires. I think I inspired O'Reilly, actually, on the other network, so in a weird <laughs> way, perverted way, maybe. So are you the grandfather of cable? I think I was the first uh, uh, loud guy. See, I taught you, right? <laughs> you did. <laughs> no, I'm sort of center left on most issues. Some issues I think I'm a little more centrist and some I'm not. On war, I'd say I'm over to the left. I'd say, although, you know, you meet Pat Buchanan when you get all the way over there. You yeah, know? yeah. So you can't always figure that one out. Uh, I think on a, on, on a lot of issues, you're the great guy on labor. You're the best on labor, and you know the issues. Uh, I think I'm good on some things, and uh, people disagree with me on other things. I have some but how critics. Have you, how I have, have you, critics. How have you survived all these years? I mean, this is hard. I, I mean, well, I mean, you know. Well, the, giving it, you know say, what it is. So you're the, asking the question, you know the answer to it. But the peaks and you valleys. Care. The you pe- care. Yeah. You get up in the morning, you read the paper, you have uh, too much coffee some days. Uh, I, I have a ritual, I'm, I, as you do with your loving wife, I'm beloved. I mean, I get up and I make her a nice big latte with a nice foamy. She loves all that milk in there. I think it's just sugar, but. And, and I make her that latte, I take it up, I, I serve it to her, you know, almost like a ritual. And then she gets up out of bed, and, and then I get downstairs and I read about five papers. And, uh, you know, and I love to do it. I love reading that right-wing rag in Washington, the examiner, because it's got all late deadlines, it's got all the right-wing stuff, but it's got good little items in it. And then I work my way through the Washington Post, which isn't a good a paper, and it's not a liberal paper anymore. That's nonsense. Then I go through the Times, which I love, the New York Times, and I... And I, and I sort of figure out at the end of that, I sort of know, and I call up my producer and we start arguing, you know. It's okay. Like, arguing. All right. Well, yeah. You, you have to take other people's opinions and formulate it into a show, don't you? Well, I say this. I mean, people say, uh, you know, somebody at another show, not yours, at this time of day calls themselves a ditto head. Now, why would anybody want to be a ditto head? <laughs> you know, you ought to at least have an eraser on the pencil, you know. You ought to at least be able to say, no, I disagree with that one. <laughs> or, come on, Rush, bro. That's a little nuts. But if you just say you're you're just basically a lemming and you're just marching along behind the guy or the woman, I mean, you really have to be there. You're sort of not necessary at that point. So I think it's like making a stew or a salad. You go home at night, you read this, you read that. You ought to read the Wall Street Journal once in a while to know what they're up to. You ought to keep a track. I read the Weekly Standard, which is the most right-wing newspaper in the world, magazine on weekends, just to know what the neocons are up to. Mm. I want to know how many wars they're pushing us into yeah. and who's pushing it. Chris Matthews, stuff. the host of Hardball, uh, mainstay here at MSNBC. How has cable in, in, in the show's in your opinion, changed over the years? I mean, from 94 to 2011, that's a long time. Well, I think people watch TV in a different way. Like, I guess you and I, middle-class guys, probably years ago would come home, and I'll be serious about this, in the 50s, 60s, you get a cigarette, you get uh, a, a can of beer, and you're home from work, and you're tired, and you're not ready for anything really deeply intellectual. So you'd watch Phil Silvers or Red Skelton, one of those old shows, and you'd laugh your butt off. Now I think people want to mix that up. First of all, those shows aren't as good as they used to be. They're just not as funny as television used to be. I mean, mm-hmm. Jackie Gleason hasn't been matched, and <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Sid Caesar hasn't had his equal. I guess Seinfeld, if you like that kind of stuff. So generally, they like to mix it up. Now, they may watch American Idol later at night. They may watch you. They may mix it up. But their idea of an evening during the week uh, watching television is kind of a mix, you know. And I don't think I think watching political stuff has become part of their evening brew. You know, I think they like to do it. They like to find out what's going on. They take sides. They, they got enemies, they got friends, and they like to figure things out. And then they go and talk to their wife or their husband. You know what I just found out? And they want to learn. They do want to learn. Uh, and, they, and it isn't just entertainment or just arguing politics. It's They want to get a grip on things. This country is in a tough time now. they got a lot of unemployment, a lot of fear of unemployment. People feel they got to get a grip on things. So part of it's watching shows like this and arguing with them and, 
and figuring it out, you know. And and, and don't you think that there's a, a sense that people just don't want to be left out? They they don't oh. want to, they want to be left. They want oh. okay. What what do you say? Where, where, okay. Oh, you, you go know, back I, to dating. This is, goes way back to a different area of conversation. But a friend of mine who was very active with women, they loved him, and he used to say, "People don't mind being used; they mind being discarded." I'm telling you, people like relationships. They love them. They like having people need them. But what they cannot stand is being discarded. And if there's anything that drives people into politics, it's the sense of being discarded. Mm-hmm. They're being pushed by the waist. Remember Franklin Roosevelt, the forgotten man. That was his whole idea of fighting the New Deal. It, it should have been the forgotten man and woman. But in those days, the men were working. A lot of women weren't working outside the house. The forgotten man. Boy, was that a powerful message. Because that guy was standing in the bread line selling apples, selling pencils, thrown out of work. And no hope of getting it. Riding the rails. I mean, it's worse than today. Riding the rails from leaving your family behind to go find a, a, a field you could pick. Something you could do. Think about it. Whole families going from Oklahoma to California. Just the, in the hope that there was something besides dust. Do you think we there. could be going back to that? Well, I hope the weather won't get that bad. You know, I mean, obviously that was part weather. And it was part, but it was something similar. It was this belief that the market will somehow fix itself. That's what the whole... Uh, Hoover thing was about oh eventually everything will get so cheap that everybody will be able to buy it that's the idea the, mm-hmm. the market will reach its bottom now look at housing today you can't sell a house because because the, the people cannot believe that their house is only worth what it says it is now gosh I paid they, a half a million now it's down to 150 they, they, they will yeah. not, and they're paying a mortgage for 350 and they cannot stand it so what they're doing is waiting a couple of years and as they wait and get older and, and it used to be you reached your 70s you have a pack of kids that have left. You figure you and your wife, if you're still healthy, you want to get a smaller place, so you sell the house. A young couple, 30, 32 years old, comes along. They buy it from you. This is how it worked in America until, what, three years ago. Mm. And now that's all frozen. So you got guys working here with us that can't even imagine buying a house mm. because the, the older person who owns it is just frozen with anger and fear, anger and fear. That when people come around, they offer them a price, they get they really chase them out of the house. Imagine you think your house is worth a half million bucks, and somebody comes around and offers you a hundred and a half. Yeah. Some some thief basically coming around and trying to get a deal out of you. Chris, and so I think there's I think that's one thing, and that's where the market's not working. And I have to tell you, you know politics, you know economics, but we don't know the solution to that answer. I don't know how to get the real value, the nominal value of these houses up to where they got to be so people can sell them to somebody and feel good about it and, and have a nest egg. Until the employment thing turns around, I don't know how. I mean, that's going to be have to be the first thing. Well, somebody's this... got to be able to afford to buy the house. But yeah. most people have two forms of wealth. They got the cash in their pocket and in their checking account, they're lucky, that they save week to week, month to month. They have some money in the bank, some something to fall back on for a few weeks. And they have their house. Let's not kid ourselves. That house is your nest egg. Yeah. And now when that goes down, and I also believe this thing, Milton Friedman used to argue this, a conservative guy, but I think he's right. When, you're, when your wealth goes down, what you think you've got in your wealth, you buy less. You're not going to go out and buy a new car when your house is going down in value. Cause, but if your value, you just read your, hey, they're buying a house in this neighborhood for yeah. another 50000 all of a sudden you feel, I'll go buy a car now. Because I got some money building up there, or yeah. I'm gonna re, re, I'm gonna refinance and makes who's the last guy to refinance up? I mean, like that doesn't happen anymore. Chris Matthews with us, host of Hardball on MSNBC. You'll catch him at five o'clock Eastern and seven o'clock Eastern. Uh, you had the number one show in cable news at five p.m. on Tuesday. Beck is gone. Yeah, I think so. And I see that it has affected the rest of their lineup. Riley O'Reilly is still obviously their mainstay. Yeah. But is this a change? Is is this uh, going to well, have a Beck, long range effect? I of think Fox? Beck is was bad news. I'm not talking left, right. I can argue politics. I can argue the forty yard line on my side to the forty yard line on the other guy. I can argue the thirty yard line to his thirty yard line. But when you go all the way over there and you say stuff that just isn't true, and you talk about the president being a racist, what are you talking about? Here's a guy that's overcome his mixed background, overcome it in the sense that he has no enemies ethnically. He gets along with everybody. This guy is post-racial. This country's not post-racial. Our president is. Mm. And uh, and to call him a racist? Terrible. Terrible. And to say there's no issue with climate? You know, a friend of mine is talking about, she lives up in Alaska. She says, we're going to be able to, maybe this is good for shipping. We're going to start having trade routes across the Arctic Circle. We're going to start having, you know what I mean? People are going to be going to, they're going to Norway on boats. 
and we're going to have shipping lines doing it. Don't tell me we don't have a climate thing going on. There's mm-hmm. something strange going on. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he just denies all this. He probably denies evolution. He probably denies everything. But most importantly, I think he's really personal, and I think he really hurts the country. Now, O'Reilly we can argue with, and I, I think O'Reilly's begins to look more sane the more you think about Glenn Beck. Mm-hmm. But uh, you may not agree with me on that. You're a tougher man. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chris Matthews with us here on the Ed Schultz Radio Show. When we come back, I want to go uh, into your roots on Capitol Hill. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you worked with Tip O'Neill. He did a lot of deals with Reagan. The culture of the deal back then and the, and the stalemate that we have in Washington right now. That's all coming up here on the Ed Schultz Radio Show. Stay with us. We're right back. Ed Schultz, where America comes to talk. I think as far as Medicaid and Social Security is concerned, he should treat it like an atomic bomb, you know, with a sign on it that says play at your own risk and you can't win at this. This is the Ed Schultz Show.